So, it, this is going to be quite the interesting episode to film. Well, at least it will be challenging, as I don't quite own as much information about today's feature as I would like. And here it is. It's a pocket watch. And what a watch it is. You all seem to respond quite well to watch reviews, so I figured I will just give you a handful, quite literally. A mechanical timepiece designed in the 1800s by a guy named Ross Kopf. Uh, this visionary industrialist type figured that pocket watches were like the iPhones or Teslas of his generation, but not a lot of people could afford them. So he figured he would manufacture them cheaper with a simplified design. He reduced the number of components inside to about a half of what a contemporary watch designed design would have and aimed to sell his product at about 20 francs, which was quite affordable, quite a bit more affordable than the established watchmaker brand. Well, at least that was the plan, but the sad reality had been that the working man from the, from the mid to late 19th century did not have 20 francs to spend on this kind of gadget or toy, as that amount would maybe feed a family for a whole year. Well, I'm just guessing here and might be exaggerating, but I don't think I'm that off with my assessment. Well, anyway, um, some good came out of Roscop's efforts as the patent for this watch was picked up by other manufacturers and the products themselves became more affordable, not really for the proletarians or working men, but maybe for intellectuals, guild members, townspeople, teachers, priests and the like. Which is the case here, as you plainly see, this is a Roskopf patent and not an original piece of the first batch of 2000 watches, nor the subsequent 20,000 that came after it. In fact, this is a patented design most likely from the early 20th century. It's made out of solid silver, or rather the outside casing is silver. In terms of design and build quality, it's up there with a solid feel and great attention to detail. As you can see in this example, the dial is in perfect condition, so, is the, so are the crystal, the bezel and the crown. It's a bit grimy, but we'll get to that in a moment. I will, however, try to wipe it with some rubbing alcohol and try to purchase later on some specific silver cleaning substances somewhere in the near future. The other aesthetical and functional defect I have found is the operation of the back lid. So as you can plainly see, um, this is open, but if I attempt to close these, so the mechanism lid and both the outer um, bezel lid, it will be very difficult to open as this lid secures itself beneath the crown bezel or support or whatever this is, this dome right here. So really, uh, then the only option you have is to force it out, pry it out with a sharp metal tool, which subsequently damages the, the whole watch. I'll just show you right now. So as you can uh, see right here, there are some scuffs and marks and dings. Um, don't worry, I'm not the author of those uh, of said imperfections here. <laughs> it's just due to almost 100 years of usage. That's, well, 
people tend to open these things as you can see the lid on the on the mechanism itself is also scuffed and dinged let me just there we go so yeah there are additional minor scratches and bends to this thing but not not bad by any means so inside you can see also here some sort of marking and I don't really know what this is but I will be interpreting it later on and put some comment into the video and here is the mechanism itself it's not really that visible so I shall be trying different angles to get you the whole picture Anyway, uh, Roskopf, this fellow, invented the pin, or rather patented the pin palette escapement, which is right about here somewhere. Here's the in-depth look of the mechanism. Um, I suspect this one is in working condition, or rather it would be, were it not for the spring being loose or broken or tore or whatever so the mechanism itself doesn't look to be corroded or bent or uh, I don't know uh, fixed by an unprofessional person but really there is something wrong with it uh, and I can tell that for sure because this is a family heirloom and I shall try to explain how I came in possession of this particular timepiece. So my grandfather's uncle, uh, or rather my great great uncle if you will, was a rather important figure in my hometown. He was a principal at the local Greek Catholic uh, boys school. He was a bishop anointed by uh, the Pope himself and well really not to uh, overestimate his merits but he was a big intellectual and religious sort of personality they were back then um, they were appreciated very much he was a high almost political figure and he owned this thing all of his life and we kept it in the family it's a family heirloom now, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to oversell this thing. I know that um, it's not quite as valuable in terms of monetary gain as uh, my little story might suggest, which brings me to the next point. Uh, really, uh, what does this thing cost? So I went online and looked it up. Uh, well, Torn examples start from 200 euros. Better well kept examples, they go around three, four hundred euros, and pristine silver ones should fetch about 750 euros, maybe 1000 euros or dollars, or something like that. So, not a huge amount of money, but a significant one. What I think this one would be worth, uh, anywhere between $300 and $500, depending on sheer luck or, I don't know, a willingness uh, to buy. I don't know, if some buyer is pretty interested in something like this, they will pay overpay just to own it. Now, for me, this is just a market study. I don't intend to sell it anytime soon, nor should I, because it's an important piece of my family's history. I can really put a face to this watch and remember fondly where it came from. So, really, I plan to, um, you know, to improve upon it, to repair it. Not myself, mind you, but with a professional. Though I am at a loss here because I don't really trust any local watch repair guys to handle such a thing. I'm not saying it cannot be done. I'm not saying it's overly complicated. Though the watchmen that I know 
um, they generally repair or replace batteries in modern uh, electronic watches or maybe they might I don't know they might attempt to fix a mechanical watch but not earlier than 1970s or 1960s this one being an older model with rather rare spare parts I believe I don't know maybe I'll find somebody but I'm not holding my breath on that one for now I'll just be looking at it and keeping it as a mantelpiece, you know, just to put as a, a collection and conversation starter. By the way, this mining theme on the back, I really have no clue as to what this represents or what, what the origin story of it is. <laughs> really, that goes to show you uh, that this thing was not owned by a particularly rich person so my great grand my great great uncle probably had the opportunity to buy a pocket watch at a reasonable tempting price um, and he just got it even if i suspect this one was owned by a i don't know mining mogul really uh it's just a coincidence i don't have an explanation for it though i will say that this housing is not original to roskopf but rather a bespoke um item it's one of those things like, uh, you know, a coach builder does for a car platform or a car chassis. It was quite popular in, at the beginning of the 20th century. So uh, even Cadillacs, Duesenbergs, uh, Hispano Suizas, Bugattis, they, send, uh, they used to send their um, chassis, engines and powertrains to a specific coach builder and build the one off car. There I go again with automotive references and parallels, but what are you gonna do? I am an automotive enthusiast after all. So really this is my quasi valuable, quasi um, old, <laughs> quasi whatever you will, silver pocket watch. It's quite an interesting piece. It's quite the eye-catching conversation starter. Do I think it's a collectible item? Quite naturally, I think its collector value is through the roof, even if the monetary value itself is not that great. Uh, am I glad to own it? Yes, because it's linked to my past and my family's heritage. Will I ever sell it? No. Obviously not. Um, do I have anything more to add to this clip? Not really. Well, having said that, I hope you have sort of enjoyed this video. Um, please like and if you're feeling extremely generous, go on and subscribe. Uh, I'm looking forward to your comments and suggestions. And uh, as always, I buy and own useless, quirky, obsolete tech stuff, so you don't have to. Bye-bye.